Um, and without further ado, let's go ahead and welcome um, this panel and I'll pass it over to Sean Mosley to do that. So take it away, Sean. Perfect, thank you, Cece. Um, very excited to be here and have this opportunity um, and to be here with this amazing panel that we have to talk about uh, the experiences with record clearance. There's a lot of wealth of information and expertise and just amazing people on this panel. And so I will stop blabbering on about myself and get ready to the introductions. Or actually, I will introduce myself. I haven't done that. People don't know me and that makes perfect sense. So I am Sean Mosley. I am based in Atlanta, uh, part of the Code for Atlanta Brigade. And I have not actually shipped a record clearance project yet, but I very much so have a passion for restorative justice and want to learn from people that have done it. And so this is part of the reason as to how this panel came to be. And so I want to go ahead, let me share my screen. Um, I think that should do it. And so I will jump right in and start with the introductions. And so we have representation from five different brigades. Um, Code for America, if we're considering that a brigade, um, Code for Boston, uh, Code for BTV from up in Vermont, Code for KC, uh, Kansas City to be spe specific, and Code for PDX, which is uh, Code for Portland. And we will start by jumping in with Code for America. And representing for Code for America, we have Melani Sentian. And I'll let her give a quick introduction of what her project is. Thanks, Sean. Thank you everyone for being here. Uh, my name is Melani. I'm based in San Francisco and I work for Code for America HQ. I'm the program director for criminal justice leading the Clear My Record team. Um, you all probably have heard of our clearmyrecord.org. It started as a project back in 2016 to help folks get legal assistance to apply to record clearance. Originally, we made it for marijuana and the expungement law that passed a few years back. Um, but what we actually saw and where we are now is that lots of people actually were applying for record clearance that was available beyond marijuana. Uh, with the assistance of legal aid and with public defenders. And so now we've actually moved to focusing on how do we actually automate and implement record clearance nationwide. And that includes expanding policies to uh, include automatic record clearance and then working on implementation projects as well. Uh, great to be here and looking forward to the chat. Perfect. Thank you, Milani. And next we have code for Boston. Um, I'd like to introduce Jeremy Lang, Pauline Curie, Pauline Q, I'm not going to butcher your name, I'm sorry, uh, and Michelle Bernstein. Uh, so I'd like to introduce you all and you all can uh, give us a quick introduction to your project. Hi, I'm Michelle. Uh, I am a project co-manager and team lead on the uh, web app side of the project. Um, uh, this is Pauline. If you want to introduce yourself from GBLS, Greater Boston Legal Services. Sure, I'm Pauline Curian. I'm the director of the Corey and Reentry Project at Greater Boston Legal Services, and we have a large scale, large volume criminal record and expungement um, project that's been going on for about 10 years. And we're really excited about the app that was created, which is now on our website. Um, but we haven't been doing a lot of advertising on it. Some of it was I wanted to make sure everybody from, from Code Boston was given credit. So I'm waiting for all the names so I can send it out, the big blast. Uh, but it is um, live on our, our, our Greater Boston Legal Services website right now. And I put the link in the chat box. Jeremy? And I'm uh, Jeremy Lang. Um, Michelle and I kind of tag team the uh, project management and project leading of the project. Um, and I kind of keep an eye on both sides, the uh, app team and the data team to try and keep things strategically moving forward. Perfect. Thank you, Boston. So now code for BTV, we have Jacob Durrell and Mairead O'Reilly. Uh, and I can hand it over to Jacob. Well, from uh, Burlington, Vermont. And uh, basically we created a, an attorney facing 
uh, Chrome extension uh, that allows uh, attorneys in clinics to more efficiently serve expungement clients. Um, and I feel that it's been a big success. It's been really rewarding to wor work on. I have a legal and tech background. Um, so I've, I'm both a user of the product and one of the developers, um, but our uh, primary uh, legal talent in helping to put it together um, is Maria O'Reilly, uh, who can introduce herself next. Yeah, hi all, it's great to be here. Um, Maria O'Reilly from Vermont Legal Aid. I am just a staff attorney um, and the very fortunate recipient of, of assistance from Code for Burlington in developing um, this amazing generator program that has helped us really develop a super high volume expungement project. Um, we think of it as, you know, a, a step in the direction towards automation, which is the ultimate goal. But um, this has just sort of allowed us to um, expand our work exponentially. So we're thrilled to be here. Thank you, BTV. And now Code for KC, Paul Barm and Scott Stockwell. Paul, All you're muted. on mute. Thank you. Uh, I'm Paul Barm, uh, captain of Code for KC and uh, have been the lead developer on our app, which was gonna be consumer facing, but has ended up being attorney facing. And Stock, Scott Stockwell, I'll let him introduce himself. Hi, I'm Scott Stockwell, and uh, I'm uh, the co-team lead on the Code for KC uh, collaboration with the University of Missouri Kansas City School of Law. And um, uh, Paul has done all the heavy lifting, and um, I simply am working with the, the other co-team lead, uh, Ellen Suni, uh, and the class to work on uh, development of the understanding of the law and, and applying it uh, in the application. Also wanted to just give a shout out to Code for America to, for them having um, worked with Empower Missouri um, to work on the legislative side. Uh, we are also in, in working on that in conjunction with uh, a uh, a state senator from uh, St. Louis uh, working on changing the legislation because it is a complicated statute that's very difficult for uh, non attorneys to be able to access. Perfect. Thank you, Casey. And now, code for PDX, I have Jordan Witte and Michael Zhang. Hi, all. Uh, I'm the project manager for Record Sponge. And that is a completed web software that is built for legal providers to uh, assist with record expungement in Oregon. Um, and it relies on the fact that uh, legal records are very easily accessible in Oregon, which is fairly uh, exceptional to many states. Um, but it lets us build software that can uh, do a comprehensive analysis on someone's record to um, navigate the very complex uh, eligibility rules, and it has already been used by a number of legal providers in the state, including Portland Community College, um, and we're really proud of our work, and uh, we think that this is eliminating a huge barrier for accessibility to expungement. Yeah, I'm uh, Michael, and um, me and Jordan have been working on this uh, for, for like two years now. Um, it's it's cool to be on this panel because uh, I I thought you know what me and Jordan were doing like like really like unique things that we came up with like entirely independently, as, but but it it seems you know as as it always is that like we're kind of like picking up on um, a more general like phenomenon and um, uh, you know be, like becoming motivated by that. Um, which is just to say that I think our experiences have been pretty similar to like the things I've been hearing so far. Um, you know, we're, we're also excited for the possibility of uh, automation, which would, you know, make our app obsolete, but like we would uh, of course welcome that. Um, but in the meantime, we see ourselves as like a pretty useful uh, intermediary step. So yeah, happy to be on this panel today. 
Thank you all. I believe that is everyone. And so I will stop sharing my screen and just take a moment to, again, thank all the panelists for being here. Um, I know that it is a Sunday after morning, noon time. So thank you for taking your own time out to make it here um, and share the knowledge that you've gained. Um, and so to get us started, I wanna know uh, what it was like to get started. Um, we, we all have this idea and this passion to make justice restorative and help actually improve our states and our communities and helping in that manner. But how do we go or how, how did you go from the thought of, I wanna help improving um, record clearance to actually saying, hey, I should pair up with um, my local brigade and, and see if we can make something happen. So at Code for Boston, we were really lucky, like a couple of the other teams here, or most of the other teams here maybe, in that um, we had a partner that came to us, not represented here today, but Citizens for Juvenile Justice. And um, really, I think that's a key to getting started in this uh, area is to find the people in the community. If, if they don't come to you, find the people in the community that are already invested and motivated in uh, working on this stuff. And uh, we were soon connected with uh, Greater Boston Legal Services and Pauline there, who has become our SME, the foremost expert in expungement in Massachusetts. Um, and that really got some steam under us. So, um, because we, because not only could we ha have someone who understands the, the regulations surrounding expungement and sealing, which are two separate things in Massachusetts, by the way, um, we could also understand the context um, that surrounds it, that we could not have gotten where we have without the, 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 the advocate community and Pauline and GBLS behind what we were doing. Um, over and out, I don't know. Uh, yep. Perfect, thanks Michelle. Any, any other panelists wanna uh, give a, tell up how they started into record clearance? I'll speak for Code for KC. We kind of have a unique relationship with the law school at UMKC and uh, uh, they are very much into access for justice and Dean Suny was interested in this and actually Scott had started out wanting to do a record clearance project and since we were involved in that class we connected with them. Uh, it's been a unique opportunity because we've actually used them more to reach out to other organizations. And since it's also been part of a class, we've, at least for me, I've been able to be involved with taking apart the legislation, so. I'll say something for um, Oregon. And I think this, uh, this might be, you know, very different state by state. Um, so I'll just, I'll just like share my perspective. Um, I, I, I was a staff attorney at uh, like a legal aid service basically that um, wanted to provide a lot of expungements and it made sense to be able to do them at a high volume because um, in Oregon at least uh, the expungement law is it's like entirely the criteria are entirely statutory and there's like very little to be determined by a judge uh, meaning that um, it's it's basically an algorithm, like a really unnecessarily complicated algorithm, but it, it's just uh, an algorithm that's like, uh, you know, can either give you like correct or incorrect answers. Um, unlike, for example, uh, expungement laws in some states, which I know, which are basically determined by a judge weighing certain factors or like looking at a person's, you know, whatever, they're, they're like um, deserving this. Um, the, the nice thing in Oregon um, is that you can know right away, um, just based on objective criteria, whether or not um, a person is eligible. And so that lends itself like really well to um, uh, like a tech intervention. And so it seemed like so obvious, you know, um, and in, in fact, it, 
it felt like a criminal that it wasn't already being automated like within the state itself, you know? Um, and so it, it felt like a very like natural connection to uh, try and um, impose like a tech solution. I think me and Jordan are both like pretty wary about tech solutions generally, you know, and I'll let Jordan speak to that more. Um, like we, we, we've looked at other project possibilities since then. And it's, it's like, oh, like this doesn't need an app, you know? Uh, but in, in the case of expungement processes, at least in Oregon, it was like, oh yeah, app could probably help here. Perfect. Yeah, I guess I will just tack on oh, about the um, concern about tech, a tech solution. Um, the fact that our project, uh, we focused on building a tool that was to be used by legal service providers really um, kind of gave us the uh, reassurance that we weren't building something that was going to make uh, records more visible. Like we built this web portal that relies on a user having a subscription access to the state database. Um, and so it, it means that like not everyone can just load up our website and uh, look at someone's record. Um, yeah. Great point. Um, and I, I wanna ask the other panelists from other areas, seeing as with record expungement, it feels like there can be a multitude of users per se that you can try to say, hey, let's build software for your average citizen to expunge a record on their own, or we can work for um, a nonprofit that's working in this space and doing record clearance, or we can try to work for the district attorney and try to see if we can help. Like, how did you go about choosing who your user group would be? So in Massachusetts, um, unlike some other states, um, the penalty for, for expunging your record is not high. So maybe, maybe Scott or Paul can talk about uh, their experience, but um, it is, if, if, you, if you apply and you are wrong and, and you can't get that record expunged, then it gets turned down and that's what happens or, or sealed, it gets turned down. Um, if, correct me if anything goes wrong, Pauline. Um, but um, so our, our approach was a hope that we could create something for pro se users. So that is for people who are not advocates and not lawyers and who are you know, trying to, to seal their records themselves. Um, and, and that's what we focused on and we're able to focus on partially because we cannot scrape the data in Massachusetts. Um, data is much more buttoned down. So we needed to count on um, uh, pro se users knowing their information, which is kind of tricky and it's something we're still working on. Um, but with Pauline's help, we were able to add a lot of context to the app and we've actually made a hybrid app uh, um, when a pro se user follows the link, uh, they have um, extra questions that guide them through the process. And um, there is a link that we will uh, establish that is simply for uh, vol volunteers at the ceiling clinics who just know the, the questions that need to be answered and can provide the context for the people that they are helping. Um, and I, I also think though, so we've struggled a lot with getting users in the room with us. They've been in the room with Pauline, but uh, with us as developers, we haven't gotten um, as much of a chance as we'd hope to, to get them into the process. And I think at some point you have to say, who are the users we have access to? We need to design for actual people. So we kind of shifted our approach and, and through talking to Pauline, um, made something that made sense for, uh, that we felt made sense for the volunteers and concentrate a lot about on that, even though we tried to account for, for the needs of our, of the pro se users. Yeah, well, one, of, one of the things that's good about it is either a lawyer could use it, anybody could use it. And I think if we develop tools for everyone, I, I think that's the best approach. And, and our app in Massachusetts, it's just with juvenile record sealing, because we have, um, adult sealing, we've got juvenile record sealing, uh, we've got expungement, which is destruction of records, which is different. Um, and then we've got two kinds of, an, of adult sealing. One is a, the administrative process and one is a court process. So 
it, it is a complicated lay of the land. So at least with this juvenile sealing app, it makes it, it'll make it easy for people to seal juvenile records. And in Massachusetts, we're actually proud of the fact that the courts do not sell records to these big data mining companies, which end up then, you have lifetime records if the, any of these companies get your information. <laughs> We've had to fight tooth and nail. We had public hearings on opening up the records and fortunately we prevailed and um, you know somebody can't go online and just download the whole uh, whole uh, data stream and um, so we, we've been very protective so we're trying to do sorry both. Yeah. sorry if I made that sound like a negative thing on the, on the programming side it's a negative thing but we're actually very happy that we have no access to these records though I'm just, we're the team's still trying to figure out how we can possibly tweak the or, or guide or to, to get the most accurate information that we can but yeah sorry about that Pauline. Yeah, but it, but in time of to COVID this tool is going to come in handy because uh, we used to have court-based intakes at three courthouses where people could come in and just get some help and because of COVID we can't do it anymore so we just recently launched these Corey Wednesdays on Zoom where people hear a little presentation and they go into a breakout room but it with this if we have somebody who is wants to seal a juvenile record, we can just put the link in there and they say, just fill this out. You can spit out your petition and you'll be on your way. So these kind of tools are, are, are actually gonna be helpful, which you know none of, none of us knew COVID was coming. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to building some of the other ones. Uh, you know, like marijuana expungement is probably simpler. And then also just having a, an adult juvenile record sealing tool so then you can in terms of the whole system you, you can coordinate it perfect thanks and uh uh one second scott i, I saw i know jacob was trying to speak we'll see if jacob can come and then we'll go back to you scott are you hearing me now yet yeah uh, we can hear you now right uh <laughs> I, I was trying to phone in then but i'll stop that now um all right uh yeah i i would um just to add that we in Vermont, it's fairly similar. Our records are fairly buttoned down, which is a good thing. Um, but, uh, you know, certain limited groups of attorneys can access them. So that's what determined, you know, our, our, our choice of user. And maybe there's some prospect that, you know, now that we've had it tested by the experts, it, it could be like if, if records could at least open up to um, the people could view their own records online, at least if there was a way to structure that reliably, then maybe our product could or, uh, be used or some parts of the product could be used for that. But, um, you know, and it was also that uh, um, there was also um, our, an already kind of scaled up activity going with the expungement clinics hosted by Maraid at Legal Aid. So that was like something we went in and observed and could see the immediate need and that, you know, quickly determined what we built. Maybe uh, Maraid can elaborate on, on, on the clinics because yeah, I just think she really helped foster a great environment for this kind of work that could apply in any jurisdiction. Yeah, I mean, I, I just, this sounds very self-serving, but I, I do think Legal Aid is a really good sort of um, steward for this sort of project because if it were, you know, it doesn't seem quite like something, although we partner with prosecutors and have some really good relationships with some of them who are interested in seeing this move forward. Um, you know, we sort of think that we're really well positioned to be the ones to hold this um, because we are, you know, advocates for the low income people who um, need these records cleared. And, but unlike the defense bar, who is way too overwhelmed with the prosecutions that they're defending against, um, you know, we have, a, a, we've been able to make a little bit more bandwidth for that post-conviction stuff. Um, yeah, so we, we feel like um, we're glad that we can be the ones to sort of hold this um, because as Jake said, you know, fortunately for our clients and unfortunately for the sort of development of this program, um, the records we had trickiest part of this whole process has been getting access to those records, which I know we'll go into more in depth. But so the fact that we were able to sort of get pretty broad access, um, you know, we see that as as a privilege and a right. And and we we feel like we're going to protect that well for our clients and help them sort of navigate with the help of the system. 
Perfect. Thank you. Scott? Pass sure. In, in terms of how we ended up with an attorney app rather than uh, sort of a self-serve, um, Missouri has a rather complicated statute, only allows one felony and two misdemeanor um, expungements. And also um, there are like over 80 exceptions of what you can and can't apply for. And um, the records are very hard to get a hold of and, and to find consistent information. So we have a program that is more focused on having an attorney see the information in a way that they can evaluate it and make a determination. On the Kansas side, um, the uh, prosecutor in Kansas City, Kansas, Wyandotte County, uh, has done an expungement clinic and uh, they will pull up the people's records. They'll help them fill out the form on a, uh, on a computer. And so certainly, um, you know, I think the statistics are that the, in excess of 85% of people that show up in, in civil actions uh, do not have an attorney representing them. And so um, we really should have a system like Michael referred to that's sort of um, an algorithm that people can figure out and, and do on their own. But um, in the intermediate, I think uh, that's why we went with a, an attorney facing uh, app so that we can help people get started on things that are too complicated for them to be able to do themselves. But the legislation certainly ought to be resolving that. Perfect, thank you for that, Scott. Um, and I wanna make one quick note, I didn't call it out earlier, but um, for anyone in the audience, if you have a burning question, feel free to send it through the Slack chat, not the Slack, uh, this is Zoom, the Zoom chat. And uh, we can queue it up and if time allows, we'll be able to jump to it uh, when we get to it. Um, and so I'll go on to the, the next question. And Melani, I wanna make sure you don't feel like we forgot you. So I'll start over on your side. Um, with this next question, it's what do you feel has been the hardest part for your project and how, how have you like overcome it? Yeah, I mean, I'm always inspired to hear so much about your projects because you're probably experiencing some of the exact, clearly we're all experiencing some of the same things and it led us to the step where we're at now, which is we're thinking about um, policy and implementation of automatic record clearance policy, which is like the need is so great and so few people are getting access to relief right now um, that there, we can do all of the petitions we want, but then there's still other actors and other dependencies like going through the court process system. So for example, I'm curious how long it takes in each of your states to actually get through the process from beginning to end in a petition-based process. But it, when we were building originally in California, we, could, we saw that could be six months longer. We're in a state that also is very county-based. So we have 58 counties that do it 58 different ways. Um, so when we decided to focus and there was the opportunity because of the marijuana legislation that actually made it automatic to focus on implementation of automatic and spreading um, new implementation bills nationwide. I think the, one of the biggest things that we're up against is you're doing something no one's ever done before. And we're trying to work with government to use their own data that they have to relieve the burden from an individual. And so it's just a new way of thinking. And so a lot of what we're, t we're doing is taking lessons from implementation we've done in California and talking to courts, criminal repositories, where criminal records live at the state level and talking to them about using utilizing business processes that they've had for other things, um, but haven't applied here. So a lot of it is just accessing, uh, getting people to think about something new in a different way and how do we apply that. And similarly, then taking all the lessons that you all are probably seeing as you're going through your state statutes and how do you take those lessons of figuring out who's eligible and write them into the legislation on the process side in the beginning. Most of those for policy people, a lot of policy people don't spend a lot of time thinking about implementation and a lot of implementation people don't spend a lot of time thinking about brand new systems and ways of doing things. So I think those are probably the two biggest challenges that we see. You know, the, the criminal uh, record data, like in Massachusetts, it's highly protected and there's big fines and penalties if you share things that's unauthorized. But, you know, I do think about, because, you know, I'm day to day, I, I'm always sending for people's criminal records report or, or showing people how to do it. I mean, the ideal system would be is when you sent, when you filled out that form, like online, we have something called iCORI Massachusetts, and you sent for your record, wouldn't it be terrific because you're putting in all that 
information that in addition to giving you your record that they already helped, had all the app stuff built in, and then you got your report, it also said, oh, Mr. Jones, you can seal everything. I mean, in the ideal world, and we're, we're trying to get this in, in Massachusetts as well. I mean, I'd like to see us put out a business with this in terms of just having automatic sealing so you don't have to do anything, but pending that, and we're, we're, we got somewhat closer in that we got a bond bill passed that has 2.5 million for automatic sealing, but then we still have to do a second part of it. Um, but I was thinking if you're thinking about theoretically across all states, um, for the most part, I think you can get records um, you know, from a single entity. I know it doesn't apply in every state, but it would seem like if the, the state has should have an interest in sealing because it gets people or expungement because it gets people back to work. So if you could somehow connect everything together with requesting the report and then spitting that all that out, that would be fantastic. Yeah, one of our limits has been access to data, but um, um, even uh, you know, and the reliable data from from users is something we're concerned about. One of the surprises to me were uh, was the dangers of expungement. Um, because for some people it can be detrimental and even dangerous to completely shred your records like expungement in Massachusetts does uh, because the federal uh, government keeps some residual records they might come uh, come you know looking and be curious about what happened in your case and uh, if you don't have a record there to back it up um, you can't prove that your case was dismissed or that you were innocent or your identity was, um, uh, you know, stolen. And um, that means uh, different things for different people, but for non-citizens, it can mean deportation. Um, and so with, with sealing, uh, that's less of a problem because you can unseal your records, but with expungement, you want to get certified docket sheets, which means you have to go through this whole process, which a lot of people just don't have the, the ability to go through, as well as the fact that the courts need wet signatures. And right now, especially with COVID, um, people don't have printers at home, right? And so they're, they're exposing themselves and everyone else to more risk when they try and get uh, um, printers elsewhere, as well as compromising their privacy, right? Where can you print where your privacy is guaranteed? Um, so there are issues issues like that in this situation for Massachusetts specifically. Um, so for code for BTV, I think our biggest challenge as Marie had mentioned was uh, getting um, access to um, the data initially uh, and also um, which it basically was ultimately arranged through arrangements with legal aid. Um, and then um, maybe a year after or sometime after we got the first version of it out, that we got a whole new court system in the state. So we had to kind of go through that process twice. Um, and one thing that I, um, you know, maybe could have sped it up uh, when they were getting into it, like it seemed like they were about to give us the access and then they said they wanted to look into Maryland and what they had done because we, we were doing a Chrome extension also and they wanted to speak to people from Maryland to determine the impact. So, um, you know, going to folks like the judiciary who are, or whoever you may need to talk to um, with that kind of precedent and maybe contacts from those, you know, from, from folks you meet in venues like this, um, you know, might help speed that type of thing along. Yeah, I will just say um, the judiciary just migrated onto a new case management system. And what feels really tricky now is that um, in the past, we had fairly good assurances that anything that was post 1990 was going to show up on the judiciary's case management system. And with this new system, I feel very uncomfortable being able to assert to a client, this is your comprehensive record. Um, because it's so like hit and miss. You can search one day and pull up 10 records for a person and, and then you search the next day um, and you can't find them any longer. So it's like, I'm hoping that this is just sort of the judiciary is 
um, doing a lot of uh, sort of immediate mitigation efforts and, and it will not be a long-term issue, but um, it definitely has slowed down um, the pace that we were going at. I felt like we were just sort of full steam ahead. Every time we'd get a new referral, we'd just like immediately be able to help. Um, and we got used to being really efficient. Um, so this feels sort of tricky again. <laughs> Wow, thank you, everyone. Um, just hearing that story caught me way off guard. I'm <laughs> um, struggling. So the, the one question that um, I, I'll pivot now a little to another area is one area that I struggle with, which is the idea of balancing, you know, focusing on, on some product or tool that can be built and saying, hey, we have technologists, we can build things, we have great partners on the legal side that can help give us guidance uh, and, and steer us. So let's build a tool versus, oh, hey, let's wait uh, and try to find some way to make sure there's legislative action happening and actually changing the laws that are happening. How have the different brigades found like that balance between focusing on product work versus focusing on legislative action. Well, I think in terms of my work um, with Code for Boston, uh, that's been really geared toward creating the tool. Though in my day job at, at, at Greater Boston Legal Services, we have uh, bought, we're, we're very active in the legislative arena around record sealing and expungement and improving the expungement. We, we got our first expungement law, which is, which, which when we could talk about expungement, we mean, we mean actually destruction of all the records in 2018, because we could only expunge a few types of things because of um, case law. So we actually do have a, a bill that was pending. And then um, because it was going to cost so much money, it was dead in the water. And then what happened was with COVID and then the Black Lives Matter movement, then everything was up for grabs. And then we were going through a budget process. So through the budget process, what I did was, cause we didn't want them increased funds allocated to police departments. So we got people to send in letters and to advocate, well, you should be putting, reinvesting the money in communities. And one of the things you could also do is automatic uh, sealing. So we actually got a bond, we got it put in the bond bill that we haven't had the companion piece from the, from the bill that was languishing because it costs so much money. And then we're having to deal with the COVID crisis, which we have many more legislative measures that are pending in terms of um, decarceration and um, mandatory minimums and other things. So everything is kind of put on hold because of they're, they're dealing with the police reform legislation and the budget issues and the COVID issues. But I think yeah, it, it, it would be great to do both. So maybe in terms of um, all across the country in terms of doing some legislative advocacy, uh, even, even if it means putting your tool out of business, it would be something to be proud of if you pull it off. So I work on both and I know it, it takes a long time to do anything, so. And our, and our partner at, at Citizens for Juvenile Justice, Sana Fidel, is doing a lot of work trying to, um, and, and the, uh, the other side of our project, we have two branches. One is working on um, getting data and analyzing it about crimes and, and criminal patterns and in, in arrest patterns and you know um, record patterns in Massachusetts and trying to calculate how changes in the law would affect the community and would affect the situation. Though um, mass, we're finding that the data is one, very, very dirty. Um, and two, it is very limited in what it provides us. So it's been a real struggle on that side of things. Um, yeah, I think, I think work like Pauline's and the other work Sana Fidel is, uh, and Citizens for Juvenile Justice are doing, um, at, least, at least where uh, uh, I, I would love to be able to provide data that, that clearly paints a picture to policymakers. This will do this and this will affect this population and this many people. Um, but I think that that kind of 
that really, you know, um, going to those communities and getting community support is incredibly important. I, I would say that the legislative process is sometimes about stories uh, to be able to tell. And if you have compelling stories, then legislators can get wrap their mind around it, at least in a committee level. And uh, so what you learn through the process of working with people towards expungements, you find those stories that you can communicate what the need is in a way that, that legislators are better able to understand it. So uh, I think developing the applications, actually helping people get their expungements and then finding where the system is falling short is all part of the process of making legislation efforts more effective. Yeah, I would just um, piggyback on that a little bit and say that um, what the app, the app or our plugin has allowed legal aid to really become sort of the expert voice in the room on expungements. Um, we've just met so many people um, through our clinics and and who have been recipients of of our services, um, and so we've actually been able to amass um, kind of this ethnography along with the quantitative data. And so we're now getting to the point where we're doing a lot of follow-up with folks to talk about what the impact has been so that we can have sort of more of a Vermont specific study um, because the legislative efforts are ongoing. And they've been, you know, it's nice to hear from someone like Pauline who's been doing the work for a while and, and is reassuring that like this work takes, <laughs> it takes some time. You can go back session after session and, you know, for whatever reason, the argument works one session where it just kind of fell flat the session before. And maybe it's because of things like national movements. Um, fortunately for Vermont, um, in response to um, the Black Lives Matter protests across the country, um, we, our legislature felt ready over this interim session in August to pass automatic marijuana expungement legislation, um, just sort of all of a sudden. Um, and so we had been pushing for that and other related um, efforts. And so, yeah, I mean, all that just to say, um, this has really helped us sort of become the people who are doing expungement work. We have the numbers, we have the stories, we have really the expertise, um, so. That's such a good point and such a really clarifying story to me of what we see kind of nationwide as well, which is uh, we often at Come for America have this slide that's in a lot of our decks and it's two circles that are Venn diagram, one's policy, one's tech. And so when I think about all of the projects and the technology, like what we get from that are numbers behind all the stories that all of the partners here already know. And sometimes some audiences need those numbers. Some audiences need to see how many people that we can help even with technology in the current statute to start to build the case for why they need a difference in policy change. And at the same time, I think like just the power in this room and the power that as citizens and residents of your states, you all have to be, care to be caring and considering what's happening with record clearance, like that adds to this case too. It looks like it's an issue that affects and impacts most of us. And I will say that like one of the most positive parts of COVID for me has been like we continue to see legislation being passed in this moment because it is a direct connection to like why do we want these policies to be in place and why do we want people to have access to them because a criminal barrier sets up so many barriers to employment, education, housing and having this happen automatically actually gets everyone the relief that they should have and are legally entitled to. Um, so like we saw a really big win last week in Michigan that passed an automatic record clearance law that we worked on. We've seen expansion of laws in Louisiana and North Carolina, and we're seeing even in this moment that people are connecting this to the recovery story for COVID too, which is really exciting. Perfect. Thanks everyone. And, and I believe I've heard it before. Um, someone was saying in response to this of uh, the idea of being a yes and and not kind of thinking of it as separate. Um, so I, I just wanted to like echo that um, and how that helped help me to rethink the the entire lay of the land. 
So I want to go to one of the questions that came in, uh, and it's from Mike Brown and Code for Buffalo. And it's, how do you go about building trust with the courts uh, slash government in terms of gaining secure access to their databases? Um, and I know that there's been some chat, but I also wanted to, to open it up to other brigades and, and see if there's other uh, reflections to add onto that. So I'll just say what I said really quickly in chat, which is that um, we've built those relationships through our partners. Uh, the data we've gotten through citizens has been through Citizens for Juvenile Justice who have built, been building that relationship for years now. So um, yeah, if you don't have the relationships, you need to, you need, like, like I said, you need to find the community that is invested and active and, and has these relationships. Um, I'm assuming by data, you're just not, I mean, it, there's different kinds of data because there some is. Of, uh, in Massachusetts, we had this, uh, our Chief Justice, who sadly recently passed away from the Supreme Judicial Court, had authorized Harvard to do this big uh, racial disparities analysis, which came back, came back clearly showing um, that the courts are, are racist in, in sentencing. Um, so, so some of it slowly but surely certain kinds of data are, are made available, but things like somebody's personal criminal record like in Massachusetts, it's easy to get your criminal record. You can even get it for free. There are no charges. Sealing is also free. But um, but in terms of their sharing data, for example, so that you could have your app work more ideally in that it sucked in all the information and did it through an intermediary, that's, it's, it's just not going to happen. I've had enough uh, meetings with the commissioner of probation to, to do that. But then on the other hand, I think that there might be a way to create things and then tack it on to some other existing, like for example, the record report entity, so that when they printed it out, there, there might be other ways around it. But by and large, they're not going to give us just, I mean, I can get any client's criminal record easily, but they're not going to give me blanket access to anybody else's criminal record data. I think also the thing that I added in chat is just Good for America is definitely positioned in a specific way. We also work through partners in all of our states. We have direct community-based groups who are local there who are the advocates running the bills that we partner with. Um, so it's that and it's through like data sharing agreements and formal formalized relationships with state government, which we do have the ability to definitely lean on the fact that is a big part of the work that we do across all of our um, projects here at Good for America. And one thing I would say, if if you're just starting out and you don't know who those partners are, um, make an appointment with the chief administrative judge of, of your county, um, visit with the district attorney to find out whether they're friendly uh, about this issue. Uh, Supreme Courts typically have the most control over the data besides legislature, and um, they have access to justice committees that are working on these kind of issues. So find who those people are, call, contact your legal aid people, um, just meet people and find, find out where some interest might lie. Amazing. Uh, oh, Jordan, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so for Oregon, we really found that that wasn't very much of a barrier, which is to say that uh, because the, the database um, only relies on a subscription, which is really easy to get, um, what we did was basically check with a number of people. We checked with the people who implemented and ran the database and the people in uh, on the state side who owned the product um, and then legal experts. And we basically said, hey, is this okay? And we got a kind of uh, general sense of like, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> there was nothing really to um, like get, a, get an agreement from someone, um, which was just really lucky for us. All right, perfect. I know that we are coming quick on time. We have five minutes left. So I want to do a quick question to the panelists, which is if you could go back to the day that you were first starting on this project in record clearance, what advice would you give to yourself so that you kind of prevented a mistake or mishap that you didn't see? Uh, 
Um, so our experience at Code for Boston, um, I think we, uh, not speaking for Pauline and the GBLS side, just for the project in the room, um, I, I wish we had gotten some skills on board at the beginning that um, were more project management based and um, kind of community outreach based. Um, I also would say that there are times where I would, I would suggest checking in on your goals every now and then and um, making sure that you're still on track and, they, and that the goal is still, that goal, that specific goal is still the thing you wanna be heading towards. We changed goals a couple times and I think it ended up being for the benefit of our project, for example, from uh, straight up expungement to juvenile ceiling, which ended up being a more, more achievable goal and, and a good pilot for uh, our future work. Um, so, um, but I do wish we checked in more in, in the development group as we were going and make sure, made sure we were still on track for what our goals were and what, what we wanted to achieve. So I think a challenge that our project had was um, initially it was created as uh, kind of a spec uh, that was handed over from uh, from Michael with the legal expertise given to a group of developers. And we said, okay, we think we can build this. And we spent several months uh, working on it, uh, largely independent from uh, getting Michael's feedback and uh, continued uh, legal expertise. And it took us a while to realize that like, okay, if we we're gonna actually build this to be like completely accurate um, and like make sure that it's really doing a correct analysis, then um, we then really started to work more closely with Michael and with other um, legal experts to just make sure that we're, we're building something correctly. Um, and that ended up being uh, a huge um, time and energy uh, cost. Okay, time for one more quick one. I can speak for Code for KC. Uh, our experience with the law class and, and has been very good, but very academic. There's really two things. I wish we would have had a, another partner with them that had actually been doing a lot of expungements. Uh, we were a little bit more academic there, but uh, very good connections. And the other thing, I think with that, we would have probably have been iterating on our software a lot sooner. Uh, now that we have something up and going and we're able to iterate, it's, it feels a lot better. All right, everyone, I just wanna thank the entire panel, thank the attendees. Uh, this has been amazing. Um, and I know that we are pretty much right at time. Cece, is that, is, are we good and clear? Yep, we're good. Um, I will be actually ending this call. So if you're going to be in the same room, um, I'm going to be opening a different room for that. So come um, to Slack, the Clean Slate channel. And there's also a channel specifically for uh, more generally for criminal justice, justice at CFA. Sorry, quick plug. No worries, for sure. Please go to Clean Slate. <laughs> and thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, thank you. Appreciate you all. Bye. Thank you all. Thank you, Sean.